welcome. Come in, come in. Um, so that was incredibly, incredibly interesting, and I think and I hope that for a lot of you here, it, it has opened up that doorway into just what blockchain could potentially impact and what kind of changes we could be looking at. Of course, um, uh, moving from things that are very, very technical, very, very theoretical into practical um, applications of this technology and of Web3. So, um, I'm going to do a show and tell because I think a lot of what we're seeing is about um, talking. I'm going to show you what we've been doing and specifically focusing on um, these bounties for social impact. Now, um, bounties are um, simply tasks that are set up by individuals or organizations and because we are in the blockchain space, they have a crypto reward attached to them. Very, very simple format. Again, as Santi touched on, it doesn't need to be overly complicated to, for it to be efficient. And so what we've been doing with bounties, which is essentially crypto incentives, is we've started looking at how these incentives could potentially um, generate and ignite action and to that effect, positive action in terms of social impact and environmental impact. And what I would like to do is show you um, a, a documentary about a pilot that we ran in the Philippines last year in December across two days where we onboarded the people participating in the cleanup onto Web3 wallets, which is what you need in order to access the Web3 applications, one of which Bounties Network is. and paid people with ETH and also gave them the option of obviously exchanging that ETH into Filipino peso so we didn't just turn up, gave them internet, magic internet money and then left because that would be wrong. So um, I'm going to play this. Hopefully um, the sound is, um, will be okay. I know that we had a little bit of um, noise coming from the other stages. But without further ado, hopefully this works. <laughs> are conducted an inspection on alleged establishments throwing garbage and disposing their wastewater into Manila Bay. Disposable plastic used just once are one of the leading causes of pollution. An area that was once thriving with marine life is now choked by discharge from an overcrowded city. The trash issue really is impacting people's lives. It's also made the country the third biggest polluter of oceans. China and Indonesia rank first and second. Many people complain that their salaries are not increasing, their benefits have been cut off. It's already been hard for a lot of people, and it's getting a lot harder day by day. Riverbanks are lined with shanty houses. Of course, they're not connected to the sewer system, and they don't have septic tanks. The effluence and rubbish simply goes straight into the river. I'm Ronald Dapines. I'm 50 years old. It's my work to gather the trust from the ocean, and then we convert to some very presentable materials. We do not use bagay. So we're getting ready to pilot our ocean cleanup program. The one thing I knew was always essential for us going into this was finding people on the ground who were already impacting the environment within those communities. That's the reason I think that Ronald is going to play such a huge role in this because, you know, he's already innovating on recycling methods, you know, on the ground. I'm from the uh, province of Iloilo, from Visayas. My life in province is my father's ceiling fish and my mother is a housewife. Our work there is farming. Una nakarating ako rito since 1991. Ganap ako ng trabaho. Dahil uh, undergrad ako, hindi ako nakatapos ng marine. Uh, so, 
pumunta ako ng Manila. Tapos, uh, naghanap ako ng trabaho sa construction boy. As a construction worker, hirap na hirap ako mag ano, ng trabaho after ng ilang months, no work, no salary. Pumunta ako dyan sa, sa nakara, nakarating ako dyan sa may recycling, recycling na yan dahil sa isang problema. Through the help of the other co colleagues, mga kasama ko sa trabaho, napag-isipan namin, doon nga sa kwento-kwentuhan lang, pakapi-kapi. Nakikita kasi namin dahil sa likod lang namin yung, yung basura, uh, kami rin ang nakakaamoy ng very bad smell. Ano kaya ang maganda nating gawin? para sa, sa basura na ito. Ano kaya ang dapat natin gawin para ma-resolve na rin ang problema na ito? and a bunch of other stuff that we did not expect to find in the ocean. This area has such amazing beauty. It was exciting to see people really keen to participate in its regeneration. Bounties Network is pretty much a very simple tool on the Ethereum blockchain. It's a task that you create, somebody fulfills it, and a reward is delivered to the fulfiller. The idea was to re-engineer the way social impact works, whereby we incentivize individuals and reward them for their positive action, for their positive social impact, or in this case, environmental impact. So the way it works is that you post a new bounty and start sharing it with people from all around the world, people who actually believe in the cause behind the bounty. Once you have money in the pot, you can actually start sharing that with people who can actually do the actions. Once they've completed whatever task you've asked for, they submit a proof of that. For example, for us, it was taking a picture of yourself with the trash. And the people who put up the bounty, us the organizers, can immediately see that, yes, the proof is valid and immediately accept it. And when we do that, the money goes directly to their wallet on their mobile phones. So these people on the ground don't have to worry about us having the money or having to uh, have their identities verified. They can immediately take that cryptocurrency and connect it with a local exchange to be able to pay their bills. Okay, as soon as I get a notification, I'm gonna accept that and it will send money into your account. I'm saying yes, I'm, I'm willing to participate with my volunteers. I say to my volunteers who will participate, I say I need 25 person, but the sign almost 36 person. I'm pretty excited by how, you know, willing the participants were to get onboarded, you know, and learn about cryptocurrency. It was kind of inspiring seeing how much their eyes kind of lit up when they had that realization that you know, this technology has such a big impact. It is something that is evolving and it is something that is getting easier and it's something that will empower people here to not only improve the health of their environment, like we've seen here at La Papagea, but also improve how they earn money, how they can sustain their, their communities. Sa trabaho namin, sa marine engineer, hindi ko naman linya yun uh, sa ano ng recycling. But sa ano ng trabaho namin, kailangan namin i-resolve yung isang problema na dapat kailangan i-resolve. Nang paraan kung ano ang magandang gawin sa basura. Kayo, parang kukuha kayo ng basura tapos na i-ano nyo dyan ha na ipilian ninyo. So, separate ninyo yung ano. Uh, ito, yung, yung, yung mga napili naming basura, yung mga plastic na pangbenta, uh, doon namin nilalagay. So, dali, tapos itong uh, mga nabubulok is dyan naman sa kabilang side for composting, shredding, composting. And then, yung ibang materials, yung like residual waste, doon na sa melting area namin. 
Kaya yan, tinutunaw na lang natin yung, ano, yung basura, pero hindi naman ano, siya na, na big sabihin na sinusunog natin. Hindi, minimelt lang siya natin. And then the carbon emission goes up there. Doon sa carbon emission natin, meron tayong, ano, meron tayong pagkukontrol din doon sa usok. So meron tayong ginawang mist na nag spray sa usok para yung carbon bababa. Hindi siya aakyat ng paitaas. So ito na yung finished product ng from residual waste. Um, meron tayong fence panel, traffic cones, and then the garden tiles. And then this, ito ay yung tinatawag kong ano, yung cold mix, cold mix na product. Ito yung gawa sa cemento uh, and then chop o oh, shred uh, residual waste plastic. Dito nagagamit na namin lahat yung mga mga product namin kagaya ng paso. And then yung ibang ano is yung panel. Uh, ito na ginagawa namin boardwalk. Eh, na ano namin to dahil nung una kaming gumawa ng, ng, ng tulay rito, ang ginamit naming material is yung bambu at saka yung kahoy, wood. Pero hindi siya tumagal dahil nabubulok. Ito, to siguro naka, ano na to siya, naka 3 years na na-install na, na, na namin. Siguro tatagal tong ano na to. Tsaka hindi natin malaman na yun pala ang inaapakan natin is uh, basura. people with bounties is that we can leave but the bounty will still be there and so people can continue to contribute to it and likewise people can continue to fulfill that bounty by picking up trash on a daily basis so this can become a new source of income for people such that they don't have to worry about the fish populations but they can actually start cleaning up their local communities it's very important to understand like how impactful like financial incentives can be in the market in an environment like Philippines most people here don't have any form of savings uh, they really you know, live day to day. So if you're able to offer somebody an incentive, it's going to translate, you know, immediately. So incentives are behavior changing. If you're able to channel that, you're going to be able to mobilize a lot of people. What happens when a traditional job like fishing stops being sustainable? You need to create new means of income. You need to create and, and infuse new life into those communities by giving them alternatives. And so the beauty with the bounties-based model is that you essentially can create this task that can be contributed to from all over the world, and the payout goes directly to the people performing those tasks. So we don't have the usual, a certain percentage went to marketing, a certain percentage went to bonuses for execs. You have the full part of the bounty going directly to the individuals performing the work. And so that not only mobilizes funds on a global level, but it mobilizes and it enables and it empowers work at an individual and community level. We saw that monetary incentives were a great way to get people on the ground, but now that they're here, they actually can look past those incentives and really feel the intrinsic motivation. <laughs> sa case ng ano ng ako nga ako masaya diyan sa sa aking trabaho masaya ako hindi mo magagawa yung isang bagay sa yung trabaho kung hindi ka dedicated doon sa isang trabaho mo o hindi mo siya gusto may may babahagi ko sa mga mga kabataan yung mga nagawa namin no? ay kasasaya tong ginagawa namin is para is hindi para sa amin kundi para sa next future or generation. Not for me, for the future. So, that was a... Oh my God, that's a high step. Um, so, that was...
you heard it all, you saw a lot of what, what we did. And the reason, and I just want to point out a couple of the key points, is that we crowdsourced the funds for that bounty from just open it up to people. So we, we put some money in as a project, but not that much. Other projects from the Ethereum ecosystem contributed to the bounty, and then individuals contributed to the bounty. There were people donating $5 worth of ETH, $10 worth of ETH, and again, the beauty of it is they donated to the, to the bounty, the money sits in the smart contract. You will have heard this term. It's the code that ensures that the task is fulfilled, the reward now, in terms of dispersing funds on a global level and what that can do. So a lot of the people, we literally had this landing page and you saw that Ronald, um, who has the recycling um, facility, who we knew that we had to get on board because he could help us dispose of the garbage rather than, hey, we clean it up and then five minutes later is back on the beach. This is, so he brought 36 volunteers and then in total we had 224 people turn up because they shared it with their communities and we had people um, who were traveling through um, the Philippines on their way to Asia to basically um, come and help us and, and um, join in. So, and here we had um, sign up to, to join us or donate and that's how we crowdsource a lot of the funds. And so the main points are you re-engineer the flow of money, you have an automated dispersal mechanism that now can be employed with minimal, minimal uplift, which is a, a huge, huge problem, especially in terms of uh, administrative costs and this idea of what do you do once you potentially leave that location. We were only there for two days, and on each day we cleaned about two, two and a half hours because it got too hot, we didn't want people out in the blazing sun because I'm sure you saw there wasn't that much vegetation around there, just mainly garbage. And so the idea with that is the bounty is still there. The bounty is still accumulating funds, and we have people who turned up on the day, in fact, there's about 10 of them, who are still fulfilling the bounty, going out there, mainly every other day, once a week, cleaning up, taking it to Ronald's facility, and getting it recycled, and earning a living. And we are now in June. So we set that up in December. These are some of the stats. Again, five hours worth of cleanup across two days. We cleaned up 3.3 tons of trash. This on a bigger scale with more funds deployed towards it. And again, this can come from NGOs. This can come from corporates with their CSR budget. Or this can literally come from anyone wanting to set this up. On World Environment Day, we also set a bounty up to plant a tree. We incentivize people with 20 die, I'm sure, um, or if you don't know, die is a stable coin that basically has the value of one die is always one dollar. And we set that up, we had three submissions within the first five hours. And they were from people, somebody in India, somebody in the States, I think somebody in Romania. This is the power of something that is global, yet incredibly simple, incredibly simple. And so, the trifecta, I think, the, the core three things that this does for me is it enables access to information, resource, and a global pool of work that potentially was not there before, and also it redefines how we work and what we give our time and our skills to. Imagine having something that notifies you that there is a cleanup, you're in Thailand, for instance, and there's a cleanup near you. Because you are passionate about the environment and because you want to contribute, you could turn up and help out. And the reward that you get, you could pass it forward to another bounty for another cleanup or for educating children in the community or for translating blockchain material and so on. The possibilities are incredibly, incredibly vast. These are some of the wonderful people that, that joined us on the day, and I think, again, the key here is not only that some of them are still fulfilling that bounty, but some of them are now getting involved in other bounties because 
of their skills. There's um, a music bounty, there's an art bounty that some of these guys participated in because they're like, why not? Now I know the mechanism. Why shouldn't I be a 360 individual with all of my passions, my talents, my interests, and be able to tap into a new means of income based on that? So again, this is potentially something that, that ushers that. So, this is a quote by Vitalik Buterin. Um, it's not mine. Change the incentives, change the world. No, they are not the answer to everything, but they can be the start of something. They can be the start of potentially very, very broad um, re-engineering um, trajectories of, for new means of income, for how we disperse funds, for how we get more people involved and potentially earlier, educate them, and so on. So I hope um, that was insightful. I don't know where we're doing questions or anything, but um, I'm on Twitter. I'm at sim underscore pop. Ask me anything. Ask me all of the questions. And thank you so much. Thank you. It was incredible. And um, the level of impact this could have on transparency in various social organizations, charities, it's amazing um, what this can, done, can, um, can do. Um, I'm excited to um, invite Ellie to the stage, who is the founder of um, Open Source Coin, which is a network for collaboration and incentivization in the open source development space. Can I have the clicker? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hello from me. Uh, my name is Eleftherios. Um, and today we're going to talk about coordination problems, commons, and open source software. Um, I'm also, oh, the clicker doesn't work. Hmm. Let's see. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Give me a second. Yep. Oh, now it does. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm also working on a project called Radical, which is a decentralized alternative to GitHub based on IPFS. This is up and running. If this is interesting for you, grab me after. I'm not going to talk about this today. So uh, talking about coordination, I think a lot of people that shared the stage before with me, uh, most of them, their journey, their recent journey starts with Bitcoin. And usually you find the start in this idea of proof of work. So primarily Bitcoin like brought forward an innovation in coordination. Bitcoin managed to align incentives between different actors on the internet in order to secure the Bitcoin network around a specific objective. And while this sounds, you know, quite machinery, robotic, if you wish. It has a lot of implications for, for human coordination as well. So the way that we started seeing crypto networks evolve, what started with Bitcoin as a verifiable computation, um, it evolved with other networks like Dash or like Zcash or like Decred into more things. Uh, the, the, the thesis that some of these networks brought forward were very simple. On Bitcoin, the protocol rewards only uh, machine, verif machine work, verifiable computation, if you wish. But in a decentralized network, there are ob obviously humans that also do work for the network. So some of the networks basically included that component, and they started rewarding, for example, developers, or people that were doing marketing work, or, or, or education work, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is one of the core ideas that we try to extend a little bit further and try to incentivize any open source work that some of its protocols depend on down their stack. But I'm going to talk a, a bit about that in a few minutes. Um, following, the evolution of, following the evolution of crypto, at some point in 2015, I think, when live, like we got Ethereum. And Ethereum, the way that I prefer to think about it is a canvas for global coordination experiments. It's this big science experiment where now, for the first time ever, you know, we have this beautiful toolkit where we can engineer different coordination experiments, see what works, see what doesn't, and hopefully follow this evolutionary process. And, and on Ethereum, we started seeing some very interesting uh, examples. Uh, for the ones of you that were here before for San Diego's talk, he talked about Moloch. Moloch is this fascinating experiment uh, in coordination around financing public goods. It's very simple. It has this idea of rage quitting, where basically there's a pool of money and a bunch of shareholders. And if you vote against the proposal, basically, if you're with a minority, 
for protection, you can exit at any point in time before that proposal is actually enforced. Uh, and that creates some very, very interesting dynamics between minorities. Um, in addition, we have another very interesting project on space called Maker. And the, the goal of Maker, again, it, it, it aligns incentive between a bunch of different actors in order to keep a currency stable at one dollar. So the objective of the protocol is to, keep, to create a stable coin without having a central entity in control. And it manages to do that by aligning different incentives of actors that actually don't know each other. So talking about all of these things and being on stage talking about coordination and what's different today, we have to go a little bit back in history. And, and, and one of the most classic problems in coordination, that mo probably most of you know, is the story of tragedy of the commons. So um, Garrett Hardin came up with, th with this theory on the 60s. And his main, his main observation was that in, in many cases, in what we call common pool resources, uh, we self-interest basically go above common interests. So certain individuals would prioritize their, their individualistic interests, and then usually that would mask and, and, and potentially exploit what we call common pool resources. Uh, and this theory, like, like I, thi I think uh, until today, is, 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 is very well known and is considered as you know, the, the way to go about, about about incentives in around common pool resources. Although what happened was that uh, another economist uh, named Eleanor Ostrom, actually, she was a little bit more curious and she didn't buy the whole thing. She actually, she was looking around and she was looking at how humans were actually managing uh, certain common pool resources, specifically around physical goods, think about lakes, for example, think about forests. And she studied, uh, she studied how different groups uh, were organizing in order to manage collectively a common pool resource. And she published that research in 2009. She won the Nobel Prize for that. And basically, what she said is that actually, tragedy of the commons, yes, but. Uh, and, and the but means that basically there are many different, different problems out there in relation to common pool resources. And there are all of these different communities that actu actually have managed to engineer incentives that actually protect the common pool rather than just simply exploit that. And, 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 and Ellen Nordstrom is, is an economist that a lot of like the, the maximalists don't like so much simply because it doesn't fit anywhere. So the leftists don't like, don't like her that much because she wasn't in favor of basically the state managing common pool resources. The Austrians don't like her either because she was in favor of the market managing common pool resources. So basically she said that every situation is different but we can overcome uh, problems of coordination uh, by, by actually you know, studying very, very deeply the local problem. And she came up with a bunch of different rules. Um, now, what's different today is that, as Santiago mentioned before in his presentation um, about uh, surveillance, surveillance capitalism, for the first time ever, we actually have some fantastic tools. We have things like Ethereum, and we can actually now use these tools, tools to run these experiments and actually learn collectively. What worked in Ostrom's world only in local communities, the objective of this phase of the internet is actually to try to bring these learnings about managing common pool resources from the local to the global. And that's the big difference of where the space is today, uh, and, and, and that's why I'm personally excited about that. Now, moving forward towards uh, what we're doing with OSCoin. Uh, so we, talking about tragedy of the commons, uh, we are obsessed with open source software. Uh, most of us basically grew um, coding open source. And what's funny with open source is that a lot of people think that open source is having its glory days. More and more companies are contributing to it. But you look a little bit deeper, and you actually f the, the, the statistics that you see in there are quite problematic. Uh, and uh, here what you see uh, on, on, on the board, you see three graphs. The one is users of open source software, the people that actually use uh, the software, think corporations, think nonprofits, think individuals. Then we have contributors, and for the least technical people in the room, contributors are the people that usually you know, they will have a patch and they use the software and they find the problem themselves and they think that, what if I solve this for me and I share it with the rest of the community, right? Uh, so that's what contributors do. And then what happens after is that uh, we have maintainers and maintainers are the people that actually um, are the decision makers uh, within an open source community and are the ones that when you have a contribution, uh, they are the ones that actually have to go and review that and read that, go through that, make sense that actually this contribution won't break the code base. 
And, and when we look at the data over the years, basically we see that the usage of open source software has skyrocketed, contributions to open source software has same story, but the one number that actually hasn't grown over the years is the amount of maintainers. Uh, and these are the people that are actually doing all the ugly work, keeping all of this infrastructure up and running, usually for their good heart, for non-economic incentives. Uh, but what happens is that actually now, um, the way that the space evolved, we have all of these different corporations actually relying on open source software, making money themselves, pursuing their own self-interest, but not feeding money back down to the infrastructure that they use. And we consider this very problematic. Uh, and we see this actually even manifesting in, in big crypto networks like uh, Ethereum. There was a recent conversation on Ethereum that like a network of 15 billion right now, they didn't have enough money to finance core development or they couldn't find effective ways to finance that. We see this across the board in any type of open source software. So we personally think that we have to do better. Um, this is a graph that tries to visualize different types of open source. Uh, so loosely we have five categories. We have what we call programming languages. We have programming frameworks, thing React, thing like Django. Uh, we have libraries. Uh, and Programming frameworks and libraries are the, the backbone of the internet. This is what the internet relies on primarily. And then at the core of it, at, at the bottom of it, I'm sorry, we have databases like MongoDB, uh, Elastic, and then we have other type of infrastructure stuff um, like Kubernetes, Docker, etc. So for these last two, we have business models around uh, open source, and this is what usually what we call open core. You have a code base that is um, uh, open at its core, and then you start engineering uh, for-profit features around it. And a lot of different companies actually start um, doing this type of work, and this market is already something on the 40 billion a year, so it's growing quite nicely. Uh, but for the other three, for, for libraries specifically and frameworks, there's no business model. And, and the reason why there's no business model is simply the nature of the technology. You know, in, in a library, you wouldn't be able to say, I'm going to have two functions for free and one function behind a paywall. Simply the tech doesn't work like that. Uh, so a lot of researchers that have been trying to understand what's the value created by all of these free goods in our digital society, uh, what they've been doing is they've been taking a cost-based approach. So the Linux Foundation, for example, is taking a cost-based approach and it says, what if all this open source software that for-profit companies are using, what if they have developed it in-house and maintained it in-house? And, and when you do the math there, you end up with something massive. You end up like with value somewhere around 400 billion a year, right? And this is all value that's not captured anywhere on, on GDP as we're talking about free goods. Uh, finally, in addition, we have things like bounties that are actually quite small on the, on the open source world still. It's on the 50 to 75 million a year. And then we have donations and crowdfunding. But still, like, there's no business model for libraries and framework. And this is what we try to, to, to provide an alternative solution for that. So what we're working with OSCoin, um, I prefer to think about as an alternative economy for open source developers, but you can think of it as an open platform for coordination, specifically in open source communities. And, and, and the idea here is that you join uh, the OSCoin network and you set up one of these internet organizations. Think of it as a decentralized alternative organization. And when you do that, you basically specify a bunch of metadata for us, where your source code lives, who are your maintainers, uh, and a few other metadata. And, and, and we extract some information from that. Primarily, we extract who are the people that are actually contributing to this code base, but also which are the other code bases that your own code base depends on. And then what we do after that is we basically use this, uh, we use this information um, to, to, to reward some of these code bases that the rest of the network depends on. Uh, so we actually use a variation of PageRank, for the ones of you that know about PageRank, in order to estimate basically which of these code bases that the community depends on uh, should be rewarded by the protocol. And the same way that the Bitcoin protocol issues a few new tokens and distributes them to miners for their own work, our, our protocol basically splits these rewards between miners and, and open source code bases. So in a sense, it provides income to, to many of these different open source code bases, and then also it provides a platform for them to manage their finances. Um, 
what you see after is, is exactly that. So in, 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 our, in our application, in our protocol, uh, you have this idea of a project fund, and then uh, there basically we're using smart contracts in order to coordinate the, the diffusion of this, of, this, um, of, 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 this, of this income. And income can come in many ways. It can come through the protocol because a lot of people depend on you. It can come through donations, potentially because someone wants to give back to you, but it can also come through other means, right? And, and, but, but what we provide here uh, is, is, is a transparent way using smart contracts in order to have a transparent contract with your, with your community so your contributors and your maintainers actually know exactly how much money they can make by potentially contributing to, to, to some of these code bases transparently and programmatically. Finally, the last component that we're working on, and uh, we plan to actually be on, 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 on testing at the end of the summer, the last component that we're working on is we, we're taking this one step further. I mentioned before uh, coordination schemes like Moloch, where basically uh, a, a bunch of different individuals coordinate around the development of a, of a public good. One of the ideas that we, we, we're moving forward is, is, is very similar. In a sense, we're platformizing and extending Moloch. Uh, but what's different here is actually you have this form of income that is coming coming from the treasury of the protocol, and now you can actually allow certain different actors to participate in this and potentially claim, claim, claim a profit from that. Um, there are a lot more things going on, uh, both on OSCoin and Radical. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, Eleftherios, um, and yeah, and, and if any of this is interesting to you, please grab me after. Thank you. Thank you, Ale. Um, next up, um, I would love to invite Irene Lopez de Vallejo from uh, Ocean Protocol. You got the ticker? Great. I hope you can see this because it's quite um, it's quite dark. Um, I, I've been I've been here all morning and I had a very interesting. An uh, unexpected um, a day talking about how these technologies actually affect the way we vote and make decisions as societies, as a whole. Um, I've been I've been working on this space for a year and a half, previously on digital technologies, for over ten years, more than that, before it was called uh, digital technology. And uh, I've been always been an advocate of, on how to use digital technology to improve the quality of our working experiences, how we actually do more interesting things at work and how our organizations uh, uh, can actually perform better and provide a much better, much more interesting working environments. So today I think I have 10 minutes, yeah, Anastasia, because the whole morning has been going over time. But I want to bring a different aspect from all the different things that have been sent, said today. Uh, we are talking, we are, the, we are on the day of uh, Web3 for good or blockchain for good, decentralization for good. And I want to bring some of the perspectives and experiences that I have had personally working for Ocean Protocol for the last year and a half talking to industry about these technologies. So th these are uh, things that I have experienced for hands with uh, companies, very large companies, startups, and governments, and people that are really not that close to this space and that do not fall naturally into the open source transparent way of thinking. Uh, I work for the Ocean Protocol Initiative. We are building an open source decentralized protocol to share data in trusted ways. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Ocean Protocol is, please go to the website. Plenty of um, documentation, very good GitHub, plenty of uh, contributors. Testnet is out, uh, and you can actually uh, upload data, consume data, and test the basic capabilities. What, I'm what I want to tell you today uh, about the, the, the work we are doing is our mission is to build a new data economy. Yeah, and a, a new data economy is something very ambitious. Yeah, we are not the only actors in this space, but what we want to create are the right conditions for many different stakeholders to come together, get incentivized, and actually start uh, using this type of technologies, particularly within organizations. Voila, the ocean ecosystem has a number of different uh, uh, stakeholders, and if you follow, you think uh, about this like uh, different technology layers that go up to application layers, 
there are very specific communities that you can identify in each of those boxes. We have the developer community, we have the open source community, we have the crypto community, we have the data science community, we have people that might be interested in marketplaces, we have people that might be interested in data supply lines and solving problems with AI, we have publishers of data, consumers of data, we have curators, the curator role, very important. And we have at the end governments, individuals, and companies. But all these roles can actually mix and match, so this is not a pyramid type of, of, of ecosystem. Uh, and uh, the difficulty of actually engaging these different types of people, it, it is quite often underestimated. Typically, this type of projects fund technology development, and that is good because this technology is difficult. It has to be developed and it has to be tested, but it's often underestimated how much time and effort bringing people together and actually building ecosystems that are mature enough to grow exponentially and offer something really valuable to its members actually take to form. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples of things we've done over the last year and are what I would call broadly alliances. You might not agree with me. Yeah, some of my colleagues don't agree with me. Uh, it's bringing people together with a purpose. And I'm gonna tell you about two models that we are being part of uh, and that uh, actually work really well because we respond to very specific needs. So one of those are a um, group of um, automobile um, companies that have a problem is developing the self-driving car. You know, for that, you have a huge amount of data. You really need to go through a lot of different type of data that no single uh, car manufacturer uh, can, can gather. So these people come together to actually pull data and knowledge that, is, that makes sense. And you can do that using a number of technologies, including Ocean Protocol, but actually, building a global alliance of partners that actually can pull the data and agree on doing that and identify the right use cases for the sector and move things forward, it is essential. That exists is called MOBI, and uh, all those are the partners that currently the alliance has. It is a membership-based alliance. It's industry-driven. The top layer are the companies involved. The box on the left are the technology providers and systems integrators that are in the consortium, and the box on the right are the different um, associations and memberships that are actually bringing their own, um, say, constituencies or memberships into the mix. Um, this is an interesting play because it's responding to a need where all of the single, the, all of the people in the top box are competitors in their space, and they come together in the spirit of competition. Yeah, let's do this otherwise some other companies will take advantage of their data and AI capabilities. Think of Google. The second example is something called AI Singapore, and it's a an university and government-led initiative in Singapore, obviously. This is an interesting one. It's been set up in the last year, and, and the government in Singapore <coughs> wants to promote AI capabilities, want to increase the pool of talent, and wants to take AI ideas and concepts into products. Th this is easier said than done. It's a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, play with three key pillars. The basic research, the technology or applied technology pillar, and the innovation pillar. In this um, a consortium, you have data scientists, you have academics, you have a large companies, you have a small companies, you have the government, you have NGOs, and they come together under the leadership of those organizations. Here, what Ocean Protocol is doing and is actually offering itself as an experimentation platform for some of those ideas around decentralization and to take in some of the ideas that some of the academics have, test them, and transform them into products. Yeah, the program is very, co very um, comprehensive and goes through an, a number of experiments, 100 experiments actually, to take ideas into products. We have funded four PhD students that are actually looking at developed technology models and governance, ex experimenting with the protocol. 
but what have we learned in the last year and a half talking to these people and actually doing many other things? Because these are not the only two things that we do to engage those communities and those different stakeholders in the ecosystem that I picture at the bottom of the ocean. We do bounties, we do grants, uh, we do competitions, we engage on one-to-ones, we do pilots, we do consortia, we do all sorts of things. And um, we have engaged very um, uh, strongly with all those people in all those communities across different social media uh, parts. We have a global network of ambassadors uh, that are currently spans 14 different cities in three continents and over a thousand contributors. People that have actually bought tokens to support the project that believe that this is something good, that it, it needs to be out there and needs to be put to the service of whomever wants to make um, a some the exchanges with data and create value around that. These are my personal takeaways, you might disagree with them, but what I have personally learned in this time is that the Spice Girl said that so in the 1990s, if you want my future, forget my past. And I, I think it's important to, th to, to understand that the more traditional companies uh, find it really, really hard to come to grips with the concepts of decentralization, openness, and how you can create value within, a, say, a corporate and a more traditional environment. This is something that we mustn't underestimate. Many, many times we oversight that, that there is a cultural, there is a cultural, a very strong cultural barrier for companies to actually understand the value of data first and the type of technologies that you can use and discriminate between what is the right choice for my particular use case. And you have to actually put in front of them different models and different alternatives so that they can feel comfortable choosing the right one for their own business model and open eyes to new possibilities. The second one that I find is governance is underestimated too often. Yeah, people simply do not worry or care about governance. Let's build the tech first and then let's, boom, let's put people together and then people will talk to each other and then at some point we will get to an agreement. That is a, a recipe for success, uh, sorry, for failure. A recipe for success is have a very good idea on how you want to organize the different parties and what are the rules of engagement and what happens when two organizations enter into conflict and don't agree with each other, particularly around IP issues. And the last point is compromise. I find this the great forgotten issue because in any type of alliance, partnership, or collaboration, you need to sit on the table with a will to compromise at some point in something. I don't find that in most of the conversations that I have. And uh, this is something that I want to throw here as a very boring word, but something that is just common sense. Please sit at the table to, to think about these things with, uh, say, humility and, uh, you know, the, learn to, the, the will to learn. Um, the last word to close this, if we want to build a new data economy that actually uh, provides um, uh, opportunities for everybody to create value and uncover new possibilities, new business models, and new ways of changing society in our work environment, uh, eh, please put more attention to the ecosystem aspect, to growing it to mature it and to build partnerships that last. A decentralized innovation in this space is underfunded, is undervalued, and is, is not something that people want to uh, invest time and, and effort in doing. So I would say if there is someone from government here, think about investing in decentralized innovation. If there are people from private uh, investors, which there are, uh, think about that when you actually fund those, those projects. What type of resources your projects are going to allocate to these type of things. Uh, and if any of you work for any company that is planning to use an open source decentralized technology of any sort, think that the tech is there, you can use it, you need technical resources to understand it, but never underestimate what type of other uh, stakeholders or partners you need to make that a success for your business. Thank you very much.